Right. Good evening, people. Welcome, welcome to this little coffee table conversation we wanted to have with students. Uh, both Ushma and I have been interacting with students for a while now, and we thought what uh, better to sort of, you know, uh, do than have a have a larger audience for uh, some of the common things that are brought across to us. Um, so let me quickly begin with introductions. Um, so Ushma, so, would you like to? Ushma, yeah. there are a lot of yeah. physio, young physios also here, which is great. Yeah. So welcome to one and all. We are all a community, physio community, who are at least have somewhat interest in pediatrics. So we are, both of us are very happy to see all of you here, you know, sign up for this and see all of you here this evening. Yeah. yeah. Pooja, go ahead with your introduction. Okay. Uh, so my name is Pooja Padvidri. I know it says Devi Shastra there, but <laughs> <laughs> my name is Pooja Padvidri. Uh, I have been a PT for 22 years now. Um, I did my bachelor's in Pune. And then I went to the US for my master's. I was at University of Illinois, Chicago, and I had the wonderful, wonderful, you know, what do you say? A, a reward. Great in opportunity. Life. Great yeah. opportunity. <laughs> opportunity. But I feel like it's a reward. I must have done something good <laughs> to work uh, with Dr. Susan Campbell. She was my mm -hmm. advisor. Um, and then I worked for early intervention uh, in New York and Connecticut. And then in 2012, we moved back to India. And then I um, did a few years of parent support online, a lot of parent education, uh, you know, just basic uh, information sort of uh, dissemination about what uh, early uh, milestones look like, what do parents do to get, you know, their babies there and early detection, screening, those kind of things. Uh, and then uh, for the last about seven years, I have been working in an NICU and uh, their high risk follow up uh, here in Pune. And so I'm trying to juggle both. So that's what Baby Shastra is, is basically the uh, name that I gave this sort of program or programs that I was running on my own initially. All right. Ushma? Yes. So I'm Ushma Goradia. Uh, I have also, I have done my bachelor's from KEM, KEM Hospital, Mumbai in, nine, I graduated in 1986, a long, long time ago. I think half of the population here would not even have been born or just for babies themselves that time. Uh, so after graduating from KEM, I went to the US after some time in India. And yes, I did my master's from New York University, again, master's in pediatric uh, physical therapy. I worked there. Uh, we I worked there for many years. I moved back to India. I we came to Bangalore, and um, you know I became I did a lot of voluntary work, by the way, uh, you know with children, and then I became faculty at one of the colleges in Bangalore. Uh, but again, returned back to US for personal reasons when I did my doctorate. That is the actually the transitional DPT that they call you know for experienced therapists. Uh, it was not online, it was on site. So it was a great opportunity to to learn and to teach others, you know, my my doctorate program um, in New Jersey. And um, and that was a chance when I, I did my certification for sensory integration. I also appeared for the pediatric uh, board certified specialist by the APTA. And of course, all my time in the US, I... Throughout the years, I've attended lots of continuing ed courses, partly because we are supposed to um, attend, you know, to keep up with our licensing credentials, but partly also just out of uh, self-interest. You know, therapists in U.S. do take courses very frequently, uh, you know, whatever suits their budget. And they learn a lot and they only take the courses which they can apply to their own population at that moment, you know, in during that time. And they keep learning again, applying, learning, applying, etc. And, you know, that's the way to uh, develop yourself. So now I'm in Bangalore and uh, I have this private outpatient clinic for children uh, with the name, uh, its name, the name is Active Karya, you know, active and then Karya is function in Sanskrit, function of work in Sanskrit. So I run Active Karya. Active Karya is my baby, my pet project, you know, it's my life's passion and it 
completes 10 years this month, you know, in two weeks. So I am very grateful and very proud of it also. Uh, but yes, along the way, it has been just a learning journey. Yeah, yeah, it has. Mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, when we asked for people to register, there was an option to uh, give questions. And we have received a lot of yes. questions. So we have collated some and uh, there are a couple of things that we would like to share. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, just have a little sort of a Q&A, you know, so um, that we are able to wrap up some of these um, big ideas in this one hour. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So Ushma, first, I would like for you to maybe give our students one or two lessons that you have learned through your journey in pediatrics here or, or PT. Yes. Pediatrics. Yes. So there are many lessons, uh, but the main one, you know, the primary one that stands out is that, um, you know, working with children is very joyful. It's very rewarding. And how do you do it is not from textbooks, not from research papers. Yes, they are necessary. Textbooks, research papers are necessary. But more importantly, more important than that is seeing the child every day or treating the children every day. So when I say every day means not seeing the same child every day. Children come to my clinic once or twice or maximum maybe three times a week, but uh, basically following the child. So what I mean to say is do the hands on clinical work, be in the clinic, treat a child and you know, then that gives you an uh, uh, oper so many opportunities to observe the child's posture, the movement, the way they engage with the environment, the way they learn, the way they play, um, you know, what kind of speech they have. We are not speech therapists, but, you know, we, we are supposed to know how much speech they have. Um, so you observe all this and continuous observation um, helps you to really get a whole picture of the child. And then you go back again to your textbook or the latest research, you know, see if that matches with what you see with children. And then from there, you can, uh, you know, plan your intervention or plan your treatment, you know, for children in general. So basically, the, my second lesson is, you know, what I did 10 years ago, I don't do so much now. What I did 30 years ago, I hardly do it anymore. So that's again, keeping up uh, with research. And again, when I said don't do it anymore in the sense that some, you know, half of my treatment, I still do the same things that I did 30 years ago, half of it. However, now I have a better understanding. And how do I have a better understanding is observing children and taking a lot of continuing ed courses. Now, you know, people in India generally complain that, oh, they are expensive. Yes, even in the U.S., in a rich country like the United States, therapists do complain. But the thing is, there's a way out of it. You don't have to do the expensive certification courses. You can do a string of courses. Let's, for example, if you are interested in NDT or if you are interested in, let's say, taping, for example, just getting a certification in NDT or taping is not going to help. That one course is not going to help, no matter how extensive it is. Uh, and why is it not going to help? Because you're not going to learn everything. You're not going to retain everything. So, so let's say in NDT, take small, small courses if you want to, you know, once a year or, uh, you know, once in two years, whatever you have learned, apply it. Again, take another course, which is a better one than the one that you had taken. You know, that's the way to learn. This is the way even I have learned on my own, you know. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I I completely 100% endorse what Ushma just said. Um, you know, there is a there's a process. What you are as a young, you know, grad or just getting into the workforce is definitely not how you would be 10 years later and 20 years later. Um, so for me, a few things uh, that really, because when I interact with students, especially at master's level, my first question is, have you worked be between your bachelor's and your master's? And 95% of the time, the answer is no. I think that is the worst thing you can do because you will not get enough from a master's program if you have not seen what typical development or atypical development or the variety of development is. So I encourage everybody here who is just passing out from their bachelors to please work for a year or two. Okay. Um, sometimes when you're in your twenties, it feels like 
it's going to get harder you know like it's easier to just get out of this study phase with the masters and then you know then you're done but like ushma said you're never done you're that never done the, that is the other part of um, education that i want to you know talk about because there were some questions about how do i get certified in neonatal therapy or certified in any of these things and i feel like certifications if you see what their uh, requirements are a good certification always expects work experience in that field yes right? so you you look at uh, breastfeeding certification you look at neonatal therapy you look at pediatric specialty uh, certifications you know any of these um they will expect you to have worked for a certain number of years with that population so if you are getting a certificate for attending a 6 month course or a 2 month course um again take it with a grain of salt okay mm-hmm. um because that's what i feel like people think that oh let me have 10 certifications and you know then i'm a good therapist but that's not what it is again speaking to a little bit what ushma said is that 50% of what you do is same some of it will change with evidence you get more efficient at how you are handling you know patients why does that 50% not change because your basics don't change the way yes. you develop movement the way you develop motor control the way your sensory integration works it is not going to change it was the same 500 years ago it is the same today you know so know your basics first you know there are a few books few, few textbooks that again masters level students are not aware of they don't know these textbooks exist right so yes you have all the latest you know things on pubmed these days but for someone to read a pubmed article and then take that inference back it is difficult so start with basics right start with motor control start with sensory integration start with typical you know development of movement start with what are typical deviations in movement right that is also important we unfortunately in india only work with children with established delays because we don't get to see these kids very early on that is my third point to say please recognize you are much more than just someone to fix a problem after it has happened you have the education you have the skills to prevent some of these things as well right so don't get stuck in that zone where i will wait i will be sitting in a clinical you know setup whether it is in hospital opd or your private setup i will sit in this room and wait for someone to walk in you know parents are not aware of these things they do not understand what development is and when i say parents i mean parents of well educated medical professionals as well okay so push push those boundaries push where you can go in terms of you know um again work wise like so don't like i said don't wait and sit in this space that has been created by you know the environment of so many years push it and lastly speak up okay please speak up because that is another thing i see is that no one wants to say what they are seeing it is okay to say something wrong it is okay to connect with a speech therapist an ot another pt uh, a, a neurologist a, a geneticist you know a neonatal a special educator special whoever it is you know whatever wherever you are struggling in terms of working with this child speak up and say hey you know this is where i'm stuck do you have a different perspective again you are a pt you are a motor therapist in our educational you know four five years that we spend we are not exposed to psychology we are not exposed to any speech uh, you know uh, development related you know things the techniques that they use we are not you know exposed to oromotor stuff we are not exposed and we cannot be we can, you cannot be jack of all trades right you are an expert in motor development so ask for help speak up you know have that dis- discussion with your peers um and please don't please okay knowledge is not taken away by sharing that's the other thing i i see they are fearful of saying something and they think oh the patient will go to someone else or i don't know i do i really don't understand this because 
any person you think is good today they are good because they have had strong mentors and this is what mentorship is they give they just give their knowledge because i cannot do what ushma does ushma cannot do what i do and so on and so forth we all are unique even though knowledge wise we all might have read the same textbooks mm-hmm. but we all come with a different perspective the way we handle you know um, our our patients our clients is different so speak up at the most the answer will be no and you can move on from there but if someone if you connect with someone and that develops into a great team work a great relationship a great you know work ex- ex- environment for not just you but then you get great outcomes with these uh, families that we see right so it's all for the better ushma you want to add anything yeah else? yes one more point i would like to add is uh, you know i completely agree with pooja that you know bachelors and masters between bachelors and masters you should have some working experience um, i think for all physiotherapist but more so for pediatrics because you cannot jump into the field of pediatrics just by having uh, you know a masters or an npt you yeah. need that practical experience so how does a practical experience come uh, either you have you know one or two years of work between bachelors and masters um, the other option is when you are a student you know you are a bpt student and if your inclination is towards pediatrics and future don't be afraid i see a lot of therapists who are afraid oh you know children oh my god it is so hard it is so difficult no it is not so what you can do is to be comfortable around children if you have an inclination with pediatrics your summers your december holidays your i don't know sometimes evenings you know you can work so i'm not saying work as a physio but work as an assistant to a physio you know where you get mentored where you get um, um, uh, what you call uh, to see a lot how the physio works so this is what happens in the us that even before students get into a physiotherapy program they either work or even volunteer a lot at either a hospital or a outpatient clinic or a adult rehab clinic just you know helping to push wheelchairs help to uh, support a client when the pt is working with the client um, you know so on and so forth because many of our clients in neuro and pediatrics require two people you know handling you know many a times you know for safety purposes so uh, students start out like that and that is what i would encourage uh, uh, you know all of you here that even if you are already a physio right now if you are interested in pediatrics if you want to jump from ortho to peds or whatsoever in the evenings or in the mornings or on weekends whatever or in your summers try to work with a pediatric physiotherapy and get mentorship that is the best way to learn that's the best way to learn yes that is true so on that note i'm going to move on to the next uh, big topic that was um, mm-hmm. asked in all the questions mm-hmm. about engagement okay about mm-hmm. behavior in uh, during a therapy session mm-hmm. um from what i understand you know i think the overwhelming um you know question was i guess because when you walk into a a setup where there are children you will see a lot of crying you will see a lot of tantruming you will see the adults you know trying to control all of this and i guess some of the questions were you know uh talking about how to be calm and patient how to manage these kind of behaviors how to make it fun how to engage the child you know so i thought let's talk in general about how to make a therapy session fun and interesting yes go ahead you want to go with that first pooja with a baby or should with I a baby do? okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh, again it's it is different it is very different when you are working with an infant versus a uh, even i would say a toddler who started walking like even an 18 month old and up you know so first thing to know is uh, in my opinion okay is that please like i said you are not uh, exposed to what behavior what typical behavior looks like right so apart from studying in that sense for for your uh, curriculum you have to expose yourself to some of these other uh, you know uh, domain or, or theories that are going around in these domains um 
and again either you do what ushma said you know just observe what typical uh, you know children go through and so then you are aware that okay what this is is not atypical the behavior is not atypical so that itself generates empathy okay once you can say that this is not something that is because of me or you know this child is struggling to you know perform because i'm putting all these extra demands automatically the empathy component increases okay if you go in with a view saying that i am the boss and i am going to you know i want five repetitions and this baby is not you know helping or or moving or doing what i'm asking automatically you come from a negative sort of space approaching that session so i think our mindset is is very critical uh, the other thing i do is again i look at what i want to achieve in terms of function okay my strategies might look similar to someone else who is not approaching the session in the same manner but i think where we differ is that if i'm looking for function then i'm also in, including the parent as a team member so there's a lot of conversation about what are you exactly struggling with show me you know and um and then when i kind of i can do very simple things like maybe adjust where the parent is holding the child say they are you know trying to get this baby to roll over and someone is pulling the arm someone is turning the hip right and then because this is my expert uh, what do you say that's why i'm there is to look at what is happening and say okay this is where the baby is at this is where the parent is let's bring them you know on the same page right so um a lot of times i will not handle the baby myself i will mm-hmm. allow the parent to you know be uh, the one who's touching the other thing i do if there's an older child and the parent is not able to get uh, you know their uh, brain wrapped around certain things like for example i always find the uh, sit to stand or half kneel getting into half kneel those kind of things very difficult for the parent they don't they don't understand the alignment and posture and all of those things so then in that case if i'm going to touch the baby i make sure that first of all i've built a good relationship with that child so if it is my first session i do not push at all i am very clear up front when someone approaches me that it will take us 3 to 4 sessions for me to touch your child you know if you are expecting me to come and be magic like that it will not happen the other thing i do is when i'm there i'm trying to observe what the child is interested in and that is what i use to then motivate this kid to do what i'm asking them to do you know and when i say that i please do not mean screens and food can we please mm-hmm. also be very clear that yeah, screen not screens and food yeah. Yeah, yeah they are not rewards they are not motivational you know things to be used uh always remember what fires together wires together mm-hmm. so if you are trying to add you know these kind of rewards with movement they will not move unless you are giving them that reward always so we want to move towards independence and not dependence right so um and then lastly some days we all have bad days you know like so i don't if we don't have a good session i'm okay with it and i then engage the family in you know what's happening at home uh you know what what is happening with say feeding can he sit can he you know eat by himself or uh what do you say clinical skills um you know i can do a lot of these other things that parents are not focused on as well you know um just maybe exposing them to uh, a game a, an outdoor activity you know things like that a lot of times parents will not think can i take my 6 month old to a park or what can i do with a 6 month old in the park right so just having a conversation about okay look this is these are the things you can do these were great for motor skills these were great for uh, for for co- uh, uh, communication skills for cognitive skills for social skills you know every every sort of thing uh, can be brought into um, an a functional daily activity for the parent so that's how i work in my sessions mhm mm-hmm. so steady watch for cues back off when you need push when you can yes yes yeah yes so um pooja has given away the two words you know play and function so 
make sure that your therapy or your therapeutic activities are based on play and function play and function a child's work or a child's occupation is playing a child learns through play when a child is playing you know adults think oh he's doing nothing you know he's just playing with toys but actually children learn a lot to play a lot through playing and uh, they also learn a lot you know through uh, incorporating functional activities uh, in your therapy so rather than doing exercises we had a lot of questions you know that how do you do exercises with children you don't do exercises i mean you don't call them exercises you are doing exercises but we call them therapeutic activities in fact when i speak with parents and parents say oh let's do this activity i as a therapist understand it as a therapeutic activity but i tell the parent no when we talk to the child talk to the child let's play this game come on can you lift one leg or can you open the door or uh, can you push this box can you crawl through the tunnel you know let's play this game okay so br bring the word game rather than activity or exercise is a far far thing okay it's for you to understand as a clinician that you are doing exercises which muscle groups are you strengthening which muscle uh, groups are be you know going through eccentric contraction concentric contraction but your whatever that activity or exercise has to be designed in the form of play and function so um uh, for example uh, how can i give an example is um, that you know during therapy obviously we have them crawl through tunnels uh, even just crawl on the plinth so we said you know we we put a toy over there and say okay let's go crawl and you know get that toy and then you do your facilitation and get the toy that's how you entice the child so first you reach out to the child um i if it's a very small child you know uh, within 2 years and obviously we have lots of toys that you by trial and error you keep offering them and see what they like but if they are above 2 or above 3 i ask a parent you know what do they like and uh, if the child likes vehicles uh, i will give them a puzzle i want to do a puzzle you know with the child not just do a puzzle but i want them to crawl and take the puzzle piece and fix it on the puzzle board you know maybe 10 feet away or 5 feet away so i to that particular child i will give a, a vehicle puzzle or some child likes only a vegetable puzzle so i don't mind repeating you know during the first four five sessions and gaining trust of that child okay to give them a vegetable puzzle um the other thing is rightly pooja said that babies even i do treat babies but the first few session not only four or five even sometimes 10 20 sessions i do everything while the child is in the mother's lap don't try to pull the child out of the mother's lap or don't try to uh, you know separate the mother and the child because there the child will start crying rather you know the sitting posture the head control the hands to midline everything i teach them uh, while they are in the mother's lap uh, i treat them like that i teach the mother also uh, uh, you know at the same time and sometimes what i do is i have a life size doll life size means you know i have a, a doll which is like uh, maybe two and a half feet uh, or two feet uh, tall you know a like a rag doll a cloth doll so what i do is um, i have the doll in my lap and this baby is in the mother's lap and i do things to the doll and i tell the mother do this the same way i'm doing okay um so that gives the mother an idea empowering the mother or even the parent at times because i do have fathers too who are very involved with the children so uh, parents basically get parent involvement therapy is not something to be done you know in isolation uh, from the parents Uh, you have to get the parent involved because then you need carry over at home your therapy is not going to be just at half an hour or one hour of therapy during your session it has to be a carry over uh, you know according to motor learning principles whatever we learn we actually to solidify or consolidate it consolidate that learning we need 7 to 8 hours of practice okay so if i learn to crawl i need 7 to 8 hours of crawling now that's not going to happen in one day we all understand that but if we teach the parents you know how to train them to crawl then they can do a lot at home okay so again this is bringing back motor learning principles you know so you, then you need to have a 
good knowledge of motor learning principles you know how do you see this child you know you need how do you apply the motor learning principles in the context of your treatment or how do you apply ndt principles in the context of your treatment how do you apply sensory integration i'm talking ndt and sensory, sensory integration here because that's what i do the most um but so the thing is play and function don't grab the child away you know from the mother um or from the parent and make them cry crying is not allowed um, you can't really change anything in the brain finally you have to recognize that by your treatment you are creating or you are facilitating neuroplastic neuroplasticity in the brain by now we all know what is neuroplasticity even the students here will know what is neuroplasticity so neuroplasticity will not happen if the child is in stress that stress is crying okay yeah. so ne yeah. neuroplasticity cannot happen in the presence of stress the other thing is you know there's something called co regulation so what is regulation regulation is you are behaving the right way doing the right thing at you know at that moment okay in that situation that's a simple definition of regulation so the thing is if a child is crying or screaming and you start being firm with the child or yell at the child nothing is going to happen you have to co regulate with the child meaning that you know two people co regulate means they respond to each other's cues so if the child is crying and you start yelling nothing is going to happen rather if you respond to them with a calm voice offer them a toy which they like or you know trick them into coming into the room doing something okay you like this ladder let's do the ladder first okay and then you start your treatment there so this is how you know engagement there is a phrase in pediatrics called you reach to the child before you teach so in our case you reach to the child you connect with the child before you treat okay because our treating is actually teaching also there's a lot of teaching into our pediatric treatment so reach to the child connect with the child before yeah. you start treating them okay so exercises or pediatric treatment is not a set of exercises that you do five reps of this 10 repetitions of this five repetitions of this no you it has to be planned in terms of play that is playing with the child function so now let me get to function what do we do in function you know we reach out we bend over if it's a baby you know hands to midline reaching for a toy maybe an 8 month old baby you know um doing things you know two hand manipulation um things like that so age appropriately you have to incorporate function uh, into your treatment um just picking up objects on the floor and putting them on a shelf uh, you know somewhere else things like that so play and function are the basic requirements of any pediatric treatment please keep that in mind play and function play and function um we are not doing exercises it's all rooted you know therapeutic activities that are rooted in play and function and for that you need to be creative so i think in the questions we had what is the protocol by definition <laughs> by definition by definition protocol means a fixed set of rules pediatric treatment we don't have a fixed set of rules what you do is you keep your principles of motor learning because after all why are you doing the pediatric treatment for the child to learn learn to sit learn to walk learn to crawl uh, learn to manipulate objects um, and then of course there's a lot of learning that we facilitate indirectly like cognition vision perception so if your therapeutic activity rooted in play and function is designed well design means you need to be creative you really need to think out of the box if that is done well there are no protocols there are no protocols in pediatrics okay i mean even if there are protocols is they are basically after a surgery or after a tendon release or uh, you know we, we do um, serial casting uh, we do botox then after that you know there are certain protocols but again they are loose protocols they are not very fixed they are not very fixed yeah yeah okay that's true i i feel like uh, you know that's the difference between pediatric treatment and a uh, adult neuro treatment
mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. even though we are both working with the brain and and plasticity and all those neuroscience mm-hmm. principles mm-hmm. you know an adult brain has already learned some of the things mm-hmm. and they have lost a bit of it but if you say you know do this just like you do that you know or if you say let's do this they can't do it in that moment because of their brain injury but they may have done it prior so they at least know what it means you know uh, infant brain is clueless they don't know if you say go get the book they don't know what go get the book means at all forget putting them together and function you know um, so that is the difference between uh you know uh, adult and pediatric neuro uh, neuro you know sort of uh work is that you can't work in isolation in uh in pediatrics when you are saying something or when you're doing something in your tt session you are also targeting ot speech behavior everything you know uh, yeah. so if you think of that then automatically what ushma said that's function isn't it um you know we need to be regulated we need to be modulated we need to have a good posture we need to know what we, what you know task we are going to do it is a sort of you know it is run through in your brain before it happens and then it happens that is what function is so now can you look at it big picture and then break it down into smaller components and then you know pick pick one or two things that you're going to focus on for that session it doesn't have to be the whole thing at once which is again a motor control principle so know your basics you know you honestly i feel like um i have gone through so many certifications but every time i need to connect it back with my basics and only then can i actually apply it in uh, in a clinical setup you know it's great to sit and read theories you know in textbooks or papers or attend you know webinars but that is something that they have processed and they have analyzed and they are now presenting their view of you know so if they've read for 200 hours they can present for 2 hours you know what i mean um and so everyone has to go through that as a student i feel like um i don't think you guys read enough at all um you know when i don't know ushma uh, ushma's time but i remember our time we didn't have access to these books right like campbell's yeah. book everybody we neither we neither yeah so uh, i remember someone in mumbai had gotten a photocopy of that and then we photocopied a photocopy <laughs> so can you imagine the quality of you know paper or or the book that you know we had to read but that's what we did i mean we i still even today at least 2 hours of reading a day you know um i wouldn't say it happens every day but at least 3 4 times a day uh, in a week you know you have to read you have to read there's no other way to get there's around no this way. yeah and in today's world you know there are a lot of blog posts also from where again i'm saying don't believe everything that is written there because there are very good blog posts and there are not so good blog posts but by reading uh, you know frequently uh, finding many blog posts on a particular topic you can figure out you know uh, what yeah. is that post trying to say or uh, you know about a particular system let's say about attention or about behavior so again when i say behavior uh, we can't miss out that all behavior is communication yeah so whether it's a child with autism whether a child with adhd whether even a child with cp just because a child with cerebral palsy comes to you your work meaning of physio's work doesn't get done with only addressing the spasticity or the walking or um, you know the sitting whatever along with the sitting standing walking you also have to be mindful a little bit how much speech the child has how much cognition the child has now how do i know that how much cognition i am not here to measure the cognition but how am i going to see is can the child do puzzles 
and i'm not going to have a separate time to see whether the child can do puzzles but the puzzles are going to be incorporated in my therapeutic activity of standing or crawling or sitting with a good posture and then i observe oh my god this child cannot match even single piece puzzles or this child can only do six piece puzzles but not greater than that that means there's something wrong with something wrong or you know something going on with vision and yeah. uh, cognition and when i say vision it's not the vision acuity you know the glasses that we wear you know vision yeah. acuity the 2020 is the 2020 vision that we talk about is a sharpness of vision i'm talking about vision perception vision perception meaning how does a brain process visual information that you see uh, you know an individual Actually, sees yeah. so how yeah so how is a child processing that uh, what is a child's level of cognition uh uh you know so then we had many questions regarding cp spina bifida muscular dystrophy um i think there were two three other conditions also adhd adhd, ADHD, ADHD autism the yeah asd so uh, i would like to say that yes adhd and uh, autism uh, require much more knowledge of sensory integration and sensory processing and behavior and communication and all of that but even uh, uh, you know in a child with cp or a child with spina bifida you do need to uh, bear in mind you know how where is the child's level of functioning and when i say where meaning uh, i'm not going to classify the child is at a 2 year old level and a 4 year old level or a 5 year old level uh, meaning he's 2 years behind or 3 years behind no 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 i'm going to actually make a picture of the whole child okay uh, what is the strength again i don't do uh, manual muscle testing on a child it's not reliable on a child you know 3 year old 4 year old you're not going to do a manual muscle testing so how do you know whether the child has strength or not the child can the child open a door can a child pick up a water bottle you know these are the things i observe and i actually document also in the report yeah that the child can do this and the child can do that okay yeah. so that is in assessment though we had a lot of questions about assessment which we will have to address in some other webinar i think <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure. in a couple months when we get together like this but um for all the conditions common thing there is no separate protocol to treat cp or spina bifida or, or autism there are no separate treatment tracks no matter what the diagnosis is no matter what the age is uh, you know and i generally don't see children older than 7 8 right now but between 0 to 7 and 8 or between 2 to 7 and 8 is a, you know the age range i see i typically go through the whole picture of the child how is the child eating how is the child sleeping when it comes to eating are they still feeding in the baby bottle uh, are they still only taking pulp foods now why am i asking parents uh, that you know because there are some children at 3 and 4 who still eat only boiled uh, you know matched bashed food uh, overcooked soft foods basically so if the child is eating that for 3 to 4 years of their life i know that the oral mus oral motor muscles have not developed well and if the oral motor muscles have not developed well they are going to affect speech okay so speech and feeding i i i look at them i look at um, you know how is their posture and movement how are they walking um you know how are they engaging now engagement is another question we have how to handle so how to handle is first of all you have to be co you have to be <laughs> calm and regulated only then you can handle a child you have to find a child's interest as i said in the vegetable puzzle or in the vehicular puzzle or a particular soft toy or a particular you know what calms down what is there in your clinic that calms down and for that yes you need to have a lot of equipment in your clinic even if you don't have your own clinic i've heard many therapists say that oh but in our center we don't have this and we don't have that you know what we used to do in the us um i have done that um even if i'm employed or i'm a consultant with one company but we were required to work two days in this facility one day in that facility and so on so we used to carry some equipment on our own like a big bag of equipment you know some of the toys which are useful to the child you know like puzzles balls tongs pegs um you know many things that we can carry some therapists would even carry their own ball with them you know like a therapy ball so we would carry this from facility to facility so we don't some therapists even carried a balance board 
a small balance yeah. board. I did not do that, but they did. So I did. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, plan, uh, plan, how are you going to get equipment, you know, to a child, if you do a home visit, or if you're working in someone else's center, you request the, the owner of that center, look, we need this and we need that. And uh, then there's a lot of equipment you can make from waste. You can make from waste. Waste meaning items that you're going to throw away. You, before throwing them away, you can use them like 10 times or 100 times or even over 10 years. I have made items that I've been from waste, from card paper, laminated them that I've been using since 30 years now, the gains. So this, all of this is not written in textbooks. It is only learned by mentoring with people who are yeah. really hands-on clinically and working in their field. Uh, because besides a therapy ball, balance beam, balance board, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you have a lot, uh, uh, you know, uh, to invest. You know, make things out of waste. Secondly, even when you're looking at splints, so, you know, ordering splints, you know, very common practice I find in India is any child, whether the child is low tone or spasticity, they've always come from another facility with an AFO, which is 90 degrees. And then what I find is actually uh, in trying to correct the ankle, they are causing genu recurvatum, meaning excessive knee extension, knee hyperextension at the knee. So the thing is, you have to individualize your treatment. You know, you can't have a 90 splint for every child. You cannot, just because they have spasticity or because they have low tone. You have to think, you have to reason it out clinically. And how do you reason yeah. it is? Yeah. Yes, again, <laughs> mentorship is, it, it all comes back to mentorship. Mentorship and also I think there's, there has to be self-reflection, you know. Self-reflection. You guys are, you, you guys mm. are, you mm. know, in your early 20s, you're not in school anymore, mm -hmm. you know. You mm -hmm. already know how studying happens, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there now needs to be a little better, what do you say, ability to, uh, you know, like the reading comprehension or self-reflection. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm saying that, you know, in terms of... Um, when you are in a session, you don't have to, you know, feel like, I don't know, pressured almost, you know, to always do something with the child. You can present a toy to the child and step back and see what they do with it. Yes, you know? yes, yes. Stuff like that. I think there's, there has to be ob observation, reflection time mm -hmm. in build. And, you know, if you are going to people who work very aggressively you know i mean that's the other thing about how do you find a mentor right so you can't change how they do their work but you can think of is this something that i want to do as you know a person now getting into this field and your work uh, life is what 30 40 years you spend one third of your life working right and so that's a big chunk of your of your life that you are, you know, uh, sort of spending on this uh, profession. And not just that, but then you spend time to read on your own or you spend time to, you know, connect, you know, whatever. Um, apart from you spending time, you also get back something from your work, isn't it? You find a, a work like self-worth you find satisfaction, you come home happy after a good days of work. Imagine if you are not getting all of this from a work, uh, you know, environment or ha or being at work for four, uh, for eight hours, you're coming back sad, depressed, frustrated. You're not going to go back the next day with a good space, mind space. And that is how that, I think that cycle just spirals over time, you know. Uh, so take that time don't be afraid to step back and say, okay, we've been working with this baby for five, six weeks. Today, let's just have a session of free play. Let's see what they have taken away from us. And let me see what I have given to them, you know? Um, so anyway, I am actually going to, uh, because I'm looking at the clock, we're going to stop here in terms of this 